we have uh, Hao Chen uh, from Microsoft Research, uh, who completed his PhD in the University of Washington, and he's going to tell us about practical applications of homeownership encryption. Um, thank you, Shai, for the introduction. And uh, I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for um, their work organizing this uh, workshop and for inviting me to give a talk and um, thank the audience for tuning in. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, practical applications of uh, homomorphic encryption. So this can be kind of viewed as a continuation of the talks earlier this morning where uh, we use these um, uh, state-of-the-art homomorphic encryption schemes in practice. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, it should be um, advancing the state-of-the-art for uh, privacy-preserving uh, protocols. So this is based on joint works with a, um, uh, a large set of uh, awesome co-authors. Um, so let me uh, jump to the roadmap. So um, first I will start by uh, review and uh, give a short introduction to homomorphic encryption. And then I'll talk about uh, different uh, case studies uh, about applying homomorphic encryption to build privacy preserving protocols. So I will give uh, three examples. Uh, first one is oblivious RAM. And second one is a secure matrix modification protocol with dishonest maturity, um, which is relatively recent work. And the third one is uh, multi-key homomorphic encryption and uh, private inferencing. So um, first, let me give a background on homomorphic encryption. So uh, I think Ilaria and Yonsu may have already covered a lot. So I'll go by just uh, in, a, in a quick fashion. And uh, please let me know if uh, you have any questions. So what is homomorphic encryption? So um, we will just refer it uh, as HE from now on in this talk. And uh, it is a new kind of encryption technology which allows uh, any party to compute uh, encrypted data directly without decrypting it first. So uh, when we uh, usually say um, homomorphic encryption nowadays, it means that we can do uh, additions, negation and multiplication of encrypted values. So if we combine all these operations, that means that uh, we can evaluate actually any multivariate polynomial in either encrypted or plain text entries. So um, here um, there's a little uh, picture showing that if we encrypt these numbers seven and five, they will become uh, kind of random looking strings. And there is an addition procedure, which is not uh, perhaps the, uh, the simplest addition of the two numbers, that outputs another random looking string with the good property that if you decrypt that random looking string in the end, it will uh, be the addition of the two originally encrypted values. And the same thing works with the multiplication. So um, this is quite an amazing protocol. And, uh, uh, but surprisingly, it's, uh, uh, it's achieved in relatively uh, recent uh, time. So, before 2009, we only have uh, additive homomorphic encryption. Uh, examples include uh, PIA schemes and DGK schemes and others. I won't list all of them. Uh, the feature of these schemes is that they will support uh, one of the two operations from um, addition and multiplication, but they will not support both. So there are a lot of uh, applications which can be built upon these schemes, but uh, it's uh, still a little bit limited. And then in 2009, we had the first uh, fully homomorphic construction given by uh, Craig Gentry. And uh, uh, kind of internal to this uh, construction is uh, ingenious uh, bootstrapping procedure, which really allows you to do uh, arbitrary computation. And I should say, like, the, another important ingredient is that uh, the previous additive homomorphic encryption schemes are mostly based on traditional hardness assumptions whereas uh, the FHD construction is based on lattice assumptions. And uh, since then, there has been a, a, a significant body of work uh, optimizing the, the homomorphic encryption schemes in terms of performance, ciphertext size. And uh, some of the uh, good examples include the, the BGV scheme and BFV schemes and TFHE and CKKS. So currently, uh, the 
uh, homomorphic encryption scheme landscape is that it can be very efficient if you want to compute uh, some low depth circuit, uh, which if you translate to the polynomial point of view will be a multivariate polynomial with small degree. And uh, by very efficient, I still mean that we don't have the efficiency for plain text computation, but the overhead is about mm, maybe four to five orders of magnitude, uh, which may seem big, but uh, if you compare it with the uh, original homomorphic encryption scheme of Gentry, it's a big leap of uh, performance improvement. Okay, so uh, what are some of the use cases of uh, homomorphic encryption? So uh, one of the use cases that people can think of uh, easily is the um, outsourced computation. So in this case, um, a client may have a computation it wants to do on its uh, data, but the data itself is sensitive. So uh, in order to outsource this task, the client could, in principle, encrypt all its data and send it to an untrusted cloud. The cloud will execute the computation on encrypted data and then return an encrypted result. And only the client uh, can decrypt the result and get the computation back. So um, this is one of the use case. And the other use case is secure two-party computation, which has been studied since the uh, 80s, I guess. And uh, in this situation, we have uh, two parties, each holding a, a private input, and uh, they want to jointly compute a function on their private input without revealing their input to the other party. So there has been a lot of uh, techniques like uh, gobble circuits or um, um, uh, other protocols based on secret sharing to uh, achieve secure two-party computation. But um, uh, in homomorphic encryption case, we can use basically the same picture as the left, where we have one of the parties encrypt its input and send it to the other party, uh, which does the function evaluation with its own uh, private input. So here, this private input can be thought as just constants uh, of the multivariate polynomial that we, uh, we have mentioned. OK. Um, so this looks pretty good. So um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the state of the art HE schemes. So I wanted to first mention that um, I don't think there, uh, there's a clear winner of uh, which scheme is the best, because it seems like uh, each scheme is good for certain applications. And uh, for example, uh, if we talk about BGV and BFB schemes, and uh, they're good for vectorized operations over finite fields or like finite domains in general. And uh, you can achieve a similar performance guarantee with the CKKS scheme. And for uh, TFHE, uh, it is good for operation on the individual bit level. So um, if you want to perform, uh, say, equality checks or comparisons, uh, it may be a good candidate for, uh, uh, for these kind of applications. And the current uh, performance uh, benchmark is that it takes uh, 13 milliseconds to evaluate um, uh, a binary gate. Um, so, and then there's the CKKS scheme, uh, which has the nature of uh, doing approximate computations. So uh, it also supports this vectorization, making it uh, very desirable for uh, large scale applications like uh, machine learning. And uh, so here I have included some performance numbers and you can see that uh, per multiplication or per addition, the overhead is still, is kind of small. And uh, uh, the, the CKKS scheme is different from the previous two schemes that the computation is approximate, which means that uh, the, every operation will introduce some precision loss. And uh, it's an interesting open question to do the precision control. But we won't uh, go into too much detail about that in this talk. OK, so. So another topic that uh, comes up a lot in this uh, FHE discussion is that uh, there is a distinction between FHE and uh, somewhat SH, uh, HE or SHE. And uh, in the somewhat HE, uh, we have the computation overhead and ciphertext size, which increase with the desired degree of polynomial. And, and this means that 
if we want to do more and more complex computation, then we need to have uh, bigger and bigger HE parameters, which means that the performance overhead will be worse. And uh, so this uh, means that SHE is not a very good candidate if we want to do uh, a very complex operation like uh, machine learning training uh, or inferencing on a very uh, kind of like multi-level neural network, for example. And uh, so the FHE in the literature sometimes also referred to uh, somewhat HE plus this bootstrapping procedure. So here, uh, because bootstrapping is an expensive operation, the overhead of FHE can be larger than SHE in the beginning, but uh, the overhead actually stays constant because we don't have to uh, select the parameters to accommodate the computation. Uh, for FHE, the parameters are selected once and for all. So what is the bootstrapping procedure? So it can refresh the ciphertext uh, noise. So uh, in the uh, original construction of Gentry and in the uh, subsequent constructions, every ciphertext encodes a plain text together with some um, uh, random values that we call noise. And the noise will increase when we do computations. And at a certain point, it will, uh, it will kind of uh, mingle with the plain text so we cannot recover the useful information. And bootstrapping is a procedure to uh, kind of bring the noise back to a small level so we can still do more computation. And uh, for TFHE, at least for the uh, gate bootstrapping mode, this uh, bootstrapping procedure is going to be mandatory. So we have to do the bootstrapping after every gate. And uh, for the other schemes, it's kind of more flexible. You can choose to uh, do bootstrapping in a more um, flexible way where you, you can have a computation as a, as a graph and you can select certain nodes in the graph to perform bootstrapping. So um, one of the analogies that, uh, that we like to use is, uh, is that somewhat HE to me is like a, like a bow where you can shoot the arrow to a certain distance, but if you want to increase the distance, then you need to upgrade your bow. And so FHE is kind of like a car where you can, uh, you can go essentially uh, arbitrarily long distance as long as you uh, fill your gas tank once in a while. And so, so why are people not using FHE? Um, so the problem is that uh, uh, I said that eventually that FHE is going to overperform because it has a constant overhead but the constant overhead is relatively large because bootstrapping is very expensive. And uh, there is a cross over, over point where FHE becomes more efficient, but it comes relatively late. So for the current applications, um, people usually try to fit the application into a multivariate polynomial of relatively small degree so that in that regime, still SHE will uh, outperform. So that's the landscape. And um, so then I wanted to kind of uh, give some uh, uh, simple benchmarks to just uh, give people a feeling about how efficient uh, homomorphic encryption is these days. And um, so this is uh, uh, designed as a matching game. So we have a private information retrieval of a 288 byte message from a million entries. And it takes about 2.2 seconds. And then we have private set intersection between a set of 1,024 items and a million items. And it takes about 4.23 seconds. And then we have private inferencing of this uh, uh, neural network called SqueezeNet on the CIFAR 10. It takes about 22 minutes. Finally, we have a training of a logistic regression model of about uh, 400,000 samples and 200 features. So this is the largest task uh, probably I've seen, and it takes about uh, 70 hours. So, and then uh, in the next part of the talk, I will talk about some uh, specific applications that we have done uh, using homomorphic encryption. And, uh, at this point, maybe I'll stop for some questions. Um, I couldn't really see the Q&A 
uh, tab here. So I wonder if There is a question. I just can't, I just find it hard to read it. What is this and oh decentralization? Decentralization. Uh, I don't think I mentioned that in my talk. Maybe I maybe I mentioned it by mistake. Can you clarify if you're using SHE as a synonym to LHE? Yes. So LHE refers usually to leveled HE. And uh, in this talk, I'm using S SHE, but uh, they mean the same thing to me. Okay, so um, I don't see any further questions, so let me continue. Uh, oh, there's another question about Cypher 10 using which scheme? So this is done using uh, CKKS. Okay, so uh, in the next part, I will talk about uh, the three applications of homomorphic encryption that uh, I promised at the beginning. So um, this uh, slide is kind of my personal timeline of uh, working on these uh, applications. And um, so we will talk about the three uh, uh, applications in the orange box. Um, so, so first one I will talk about is uh, onion ring ORAM. So this is uh, oblivious RAM with constant uh, communication overhead. Um, so first, let me give a brief introduction to uh, ORAM. So ORAM is kind of like a, sec a secure protocol where uh, a client wants to store an array of blocks to the server and then read and write data uh, from the server. So the important uh, privacy guarantee is that, first of all, the server doesn't see the data uh, and all the data are encrypted under the uh, client secret key. And uh, second, we also want to protect the client uh, read and write patterns also. So uh, this is formalized by saying that any two sequences of uh, requests look indistinguishable to the server. So for example, the server doesn't know which block the client is reading if the if the client is reading some block. And uh, um, the goal of uh, ORAM is to do this, uh, 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 to achieve these guarantees with uh, sublinear communication overhead. And uh, so I think um, in the previous work without the HE, it's possible to achieve a polylogarithmic overhead. So um, what are the uh, popular uh, ORAM architecture? So one of the architecture is that uh, we store the data at the server as a binary tree. And then each tree node can contain one or more encrypted blocks and the client holds uh, the encryption key. Uh, what the client also holds is an address map, which maps each block to um, some leaves of the tree. And then the client uh, issues this uh, access and evict comment. So access is one of the read and write requests. And evict is a, a kind of like a shuffling procedure to make sure that uh, the, uh, the datas are, are not uh, primed in a specific node. Okay, so I'm gonna give an example of uh, uh, some requests from ORAM. So uh, after initialization, uh, the ORAM could look like this where we, we have uh, eight blocks uh, in this tree and the client holds this position map in its uh, own memory. And uh, what happens if the client wants to uh, access a, um, uh, the block zero? So it will first find that the leaf is going to be zero. So it will read the path that led from the root to the zero's leaf. And then it will download all the blocks from this path and then um, uh, decrypt them and read the block it wants it will move back the block to root and uh, re-encrypt and uh, write the path back. And uh, also what it will do is that it will assign a new uniformly random leaf to this block. So, and then if we want to uh, access block one, it's gonna be very similar. So we uh, download the path and um, 
uh, get the block and write it back to root and change its location. And uh, so the interesting thing uh, t uh, in this uh, picture is the evict procedure. So we have already noticed that after the two access, the, um, the root node is already full. So we need to do something to ensure that uh, uh, the blocks are pushed to the leaves as much as possible. So in, in an eviction procedure, we will just take a particular path and try to push down the blocks in that, uh, in that path um, downwards if possible. So in this case, we have pushed the, um, the block uh, started with 7C uh, to all the way down to its leaf. So this leaves some, uh, some room for the, for the leaf. Sorry, for the root. Okay, so that's a very quick introduction to ORAM. So what does it have to do with HE? So we know that if we have the standard ORAM model, then there's a communication overhead lower bound of uh, log N. So, uh, and this is, um, this is proved. So it cannot be better than log N. Uh, but in 2015, uh, Devadas et al. proposed this uh, ORAM server computation model which can achieve a constant overhead. So this means that the server is not uh, only a storage block, it, an, it can also perform certain computations. So the problem with that construction is that it uses uh, BGV and uh, demgar juric additive HE, uh, but the, uh, these two schemes are not tailored for this kind of ORAM computation. So as a result, the efficiency is not very good and the scheme was never implemented. And uh, so one of the questions we asked is that whether we can use uh, faster homomorphic encryption schemes tailored at these uh, ORAM tasks. And uh, so the answer will be yes, but uh, first let's look at uh, one of the uh, kind of a central uh, operation in this uh, ORAM. So I think one of the most important operation will be this uh, oblivious permutation. So the setup is that the client holds a permutation of n values and the key. The server will hold an encrypted array encrypted under that key. And for the output, the server should get the permuted array, which is still encrypted under the same key. So the way to achieve this uh, obliviously could be using a permutation network. So permutation network is, uh, uh, is realized um, by connecting a bunch of uh, CMUX gates, which selects one of the two input from this uh, delta, which we also call choice bit. So um, well, one thing that we realized is that the TFHE scheme, which um, Hilaria talked about earlier uh, today, it can support this uh, what? I just talked to the people from the, from the internship thing. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, Sorry. and they basically said that like their schedule is very hectic now, so I wouldn't be able to. Oh, okay, I thought there was a question. Um, okay, so let me go back. Yeah, so um, one of our realizations were, was that uh, the TFHE scheme supports efficient CMUX operation between two types of uh, ciphertext. So uh, it's uh, GSW and uh, ring LWE. So let me recall that uh, CMUX operation a little bit. So uh, the RGSW scheme um, looks like a, a matrix where uh, a ciphertext has uh, more than one, uh, my, one row and more than one columns. And uh, real W encryption uh, can kind of be viewed as a vector. So uh, there's a, a external product operation which takes a RGSW encryption of A and the RLW encryption of B and outputs our RLW encryption of A times B. So the, the good thing is that if what's encrypted inside this RGSW is actually a bit, then the noise growth of the result is, uh, is additive. 
So this means that we can actually support many levels of CMUTE without having to increase our parameters by a lot. And uh, if we apply this to the permutation networks, that just means that we need to use the RGSW to encrypt the choice bit and uh, using the Ring OW scheme to encrypt the messages. So, and how is it uh, related to the, uh, to the ORAM case? So um, notice that uh, the ORAM eviction is kind of an oblivious permutation because we want the client to, um, to tell the server to move certain blocks uh, down some path, but the server shouldn't know which block is being moved and uh, how far should they move down. So uh, what we can uh, do to achieve this is that the client will just um, uh, package this information as a permutation and then send these uh, choice bits of the corresponding permutation network to the server and the server will do the oblivious permutation network evaluation. So what we have done some, is some benchmarks on the, how efficient is this uh, oblivious permutation on um, M input. So uh, from this graph, we can see that it can um, be better than the BGV or um, the additive HE um, counterparts for this specific task. So, and then we put this uh, uh, together with some other optimizations to achieve the, the final system, which is the onion ring ORAM. So as promised, it has a uh, constant communication overhead and it is surprisingly also more cost efficient than the state of the art ORAM schemes uh, for slow networks. So this is the first application. And let me go to the second one. Okay, so the second application uh, we want to present uh, is outsource private inferencing from uh, multi key So what is the, the use case that we want to support? So in this case, we have um, uh, three sets of parties, um, some data providers, some model providers who develop certain machine learning models and a, a trusted server. So usually if we want to have this, uh, uh, this server or the cloud host all these data and models, then uh, for the, the privacy reasons, these data and model need to be encrypted. But then if the cloud also wants to perform uh, inferencing for these clients, then it actually requires decryption. So there's, uh, it adds to the privacy risks. So, um, if uh, we use a single key homomorphic encryption, then this will be a, a hard problem to achieve. But uh, uh, we have this primitive uh, called multi-key homomorphic encryption. And in particular, uh, for the two key case, we can have each party encrypts its data or the model using its own key. And then the cloud can actually provide the homomorphic uh, evaluation. And then uh, it's left to the parties to jointly decrypt the result. So um, what is multi-key homomorphic encryption? So um, as mentioned uh, previously, we always use uh, HE to refer to the single key setting where one client holds the secret key and then can access all encrypted information. In a multi-key case, uh, it has the advantage that each data contributor can use its own key. So, uh, the results of a joint computation then can be uh, decrypted jointly. So in this work, our contributions are first, um, we provide a first implementation of multi key -HE with packed Zephyr text, which means that they can uh, encrypt uh, vectors and perform uh, coefficient wise operations. And then we apply this uh, scheme to uh, oblivious uh, convolutional neural network evaluation. So uh, here's a pictorial um, illustration of uh, multi-key HE. So we have three parties, each encrypting its own data under its own key. And then any party can uh, take these uh, encryptions and uh, perform a um, joint computation 
which will be encrypted under uh, all three of the keys. And uh, so all of the three keys will be responsible for decrypting the result. So what we have done uh, in this work is to give a, a multi-key HC construction over, um, over ring. So the cipher text in our case will be instead of uh, a, a linear polynomial in, uh, with one variable, it will be a linear polynomial in k variables where k is the number of keys involved. And uh, 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 the RQ, which is the base ring in our case, will be the uh, this two power cyclotomic ring modulo Q. And we have the secret, which is uh, a vector of uh, size k. And uh, the decryption encryption roughly looks like if we um, plug in this secret into this uh, linear polynomial, it will get uh, an encoded version of our message. So if we want to multiply two ciphertexts, we just multiply the corresponding polynomials. But this is, uh, is not complete because uh, we get a polynomial of degree two and it consists of uh, many cross terms, SI, SJ here. So we need this uh, procedure called relinearization, which was um, talked about uh, earlier in, uh, in Yongsu's talk. I think, uh, and this can be used to reduce this quadratic term back to linear. So in the end, uh, what we have is a, uh, a CT mol prime, which is again, a linear polynomial. And this procedure is done by generating and publishing a relinearization key. And uh, the, the key has this uh, property that if you plug in this uh, secret key um, vector, it will be equal to roughly the, the product of the two secret keys components. So the question is, how do we generate these evaluation keys? Because recall that this SI belongs to party I and SJ belongs to party J. So, so here's a, a key generation procedure where each party first publishes some uh, uh, information GI related to its secret key. And then there's a public procedure which is called uh, eval key gen, which generates the, uh, the necessary information for, uh, for the evaluation keys. So, um, so actually uh, I have written the, the term G as it seems like it's, it's a vector, but actually each of the component is a vector and G is a matrix. So um, this is the method that we started with, but then we realized that uh, we don't actually have to instantiate the relinearization keys. So this is because the relinearization procedure is kind of an external product between the corresponding uh, term in the, in the ciphertext after multiplication and the evaluation key. And the evaluation key can be viewed as sort of an internal product between these two matrices. And it kind of, it has shared some similarity with the GSW ciphertext. So in, in here, what we realize is that we can change the order of operation but actually first doing the external product uh, with GI and then with GJ. And uh, because these uh, operations are uh, associative, so it actually uh, doesn't change the underlying message. So in this way, we can achieve two things simultaneously. So first, we can reduce the memory overhead because we never need to generate the, the uh, K square relinearization keys. And second, we can also reduce the noise growth. So here's our, uh, some performance results of our multi key homomorphic encryption uh, implementation is based on seal. Um, and we can see that roughly the, the ciphertext uh, com operation complexity grows uh, quadratically with the number of parties as we have expected. And uh, 
especially if we only have a small number of parties, then the overhead is not too big compared to the single KHE case. And what we have done is that uh, we have uh, uh, initialized um, that idea of um, doing the uh, oblivious inference in the cloud by uh, having this uh, MNIST model uh, inference. And we show that uh, this inference can be done uh, using 2K, 2 KHE in about uh, less than two seconds. Okay, so let me check if there's questions. How ORM could fix leaderless Byzantine fault tolerance security? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so let me continue. And then uh, the third application I'll be talking about, and it's the final one today, will be uh, malicious secure matrix multiplication. So, so first of all, let me just give a very quick introduction to what is malicious security. So in the secure computation world, we have uh, different threat models. And semi-honest security means that the parties uh, uh, need to follow the protocol description, but they can try to learn more. Uh, by looking at the protocol transcript. Malicious security, on the other hand, uh, means that the protocol needs to be secure, even if parties can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. So uh, this is a, a setting which is closer to reality. Uh, lots of uh, bad guys out there, uh, but it's harder to achieve. And in homomorphic encryption, uh, there has actually been a lot of uh, proposals for efficient matrix multiplication algorithms, but uh, it's only secure under the semi-honest setting. And uh, it's kind of uh, a feature shared by uh, a lot of the applications based on HE. So what about uh, the malicious case? In this case, we have the uh, speeds framework, which uh, can do matrix multiplication but it, it will use uh, an cubed communication cost for doing matrix multiplication on n by n matrices. So the question we asked is whether we can get the best of both worlds by uh, efficiently combining HE with this uh, speech framework for MPC. So a quick uh, review of the speech framework is that uh, in speeds, uh, it's operating on a secret shared uh, values but uh, the secret shares are, are in addition to ad additive secret share. We also have this uh, uh, alpha, which is the global method authentication key. And we have each party also holding this uh, max share, which adds up to the max value for this uh, secret value X. And uh, a multiplication triple in this case is uh, just a triple of shares A, B, and C where A, B are random and C is equal to A times B. So these triples can be generated offline. And uh, when we want to do some secure computation, they can be consumed to perform multiplication. And uh, addition will be done easily by just each party uh, adding the corresponding shares. So I won't mention it here. So in order to multiply secret values X and Y, the parties just need to open x minus a and y minus b, which hides the values x and y, but still allows parties to, um, uh, to uh, obtain the secret share of the result. So this is called, also called beaver's triples and beaver's multiplication trick. So our idea in this case is to generalize the, the previous slide to matrix triples. So we realized that uh, this beaver's trick actually doesn't just work on multiplication of scalars, but it actually works for any bilinear operation. So what we can do is that we can utilize the state-of-the-art HE matrix multiplication algorithm to generate these matrix triples. And uh, the 
the caveat here is that then we need to uh, uh, use an HE scheme which supports more levels or supports evaluating uh, circuits of higher depth. And in a speed case, it's only using one level. So we need to actually increase the parameters for speed. So, and then let's first recall the uh, HE matrix multiplication algorithm, uh, which I think is pretty neat. This is from uh, uh, CCS 18. And uh, what we need to do is that in the previous schemes, uh, for example, BGV or CKKS, we need to actually express the matrix multiplication efficiently as coefficient wise vector operations, because that's what these schemes uh, support natively. So if we assume that uh, the scheme has D square slot, where uh, D is the dimension of each input matrix, then uh, we can actually express the matrix product as a summation of uh, uh, K terms, sorry, D terms, where each term is going to be a rotation of a certain encoding uh, of A and B and uh, the coefficient wise product of the two. So this is a really good construction because the uh, complexity is always uh, almost optimal. Uh, if we count the complexity, it's about uh, D cubed poly logarithm D. So this means that it's almost uh, uh, as good as the plain text matrix multiplication. So what is our pipeline for uh, generating these uh, matrix triples? So what we will do is that we will first have the parties broadcast encryption of uh, random matrices uh, with this uh, zero knowledge proof of knowledge, which is from speed. And then the parties will uh, add up the ciphertext to get uh, encryption of uh, uh, random matrix A and B. And then they will use this uh, algorithm that we introduced earlier to compute the product. And then we can run the HE multiplication to actually multiply the, the MAC key to each of the uh, three matrices. And finally do a distributed decryption to obtain the triples. So this pipeline is very similar to the original speeds pipeline where they generate the beaver triples, but the, the delta is that we're really using this uh, state-of-the-art HE matrix multiplication algorithms to, uh, to make it efficient for matrix triples. So we have another optimization in this case by uh, uh, using HE in a, uh, in a clever way. So um, we also can remove this uh, so-called uh, sacrifice procedure of speed. So what is this sacrifice? So this is kind of a, a technical uh, set of steps where in the speed case, because it only supports uh, homomorphic encryption with uh, level one. So after this step three, the encryption of this product is already uh, uh, kind of having its noise maxed out. So we need to do actually this uh, reshare procedure to return a fresh encryption of the same value. And then we can uh, multiply it with the MAC key to get uh, authenticated shares of this uh, uh, C. The problem of this is that uh, the, the adversary can inject errors in this reshare step. So in the end, the parties could end up with a, a multiplication triple uh, with the C not equal to A times B. So it's not a valid uh, triple, but the parties won't notice that. So the sacrifice procedure is going to resolve this issue. And what it does is that it will use another triple to check this one. So effectively, this introduces a, a two times overhead because uh, for every triple that's uh, produced, there's another triple which is sacrificed. So the, uh, the sacrifice uh, can be removed easily by just having the HE parameters uh, be slightly larger. So this might not be an attractive op uh, option for speeds because they, they aim to um, use low parameters for efficiency. But because we already use larger HE parameters, since we need to do the matrix multiply, uh, adding this support for one more level won't be a big deal. So in this new picture, we can remove the, um, the reshare procedure. And so this will give about uh, two times uh, 
uh, improvement on both the computation and communication. So uh, on this slide, we have um, some uh, performance numbers for uh, matrix multiplication based on seal. So this is about um, uh, multiplying matrices of uh, size from 128 to 1024. And uh, uh, for two parties in the malicious case. And we note that for the square uh, matrix of size 128, we have reduced the communication overhead from one gigabyte to just uh, 13 megabytes. And what we also estimated is that uh, how much communication will it need to evaluate all linear layers of the uh, ResNet 50 neural network. And if we do it use, uh, using speeds, it will be one terabyte of communication. And um, doing these uh, matrix triples will reduce it to uh, 41 gigabyte of communication. And uh, we have noticed that also the, uh, the, the, the timing uh, in terms of computation is also um, smaller in terms of our algorithms. Okay, so I have talked about these uh, three applications and uh, let me just uh, mention that uh, I think uh, if we want to apply these, uh, this uh, awesome uh, result in the, in the theoretical community to ap practical applications, then we need to have a good uh, implementations and good libraries. So uh, one of the libraries that I have uh, contributed to and used a lot is this uh, Microsoft Seal. And I uh, just wanted to quickly mention that uh, it recently rolled out a new version 3.5 and it's open source with uh, under MIT license uh, and has a new Android support. And uh, um, there has been a, actually a lot of uh, application already uh, based on seal. So, uh, so just wanted to conclude um, by saying that the homomorphic encryption can be used to already build applications today. And my personal experience is that it works best when you mix it with the other technologies because it is uh, good for certain uh, computations, but maybe um, uh, MPC techniques are better for other uh, computations. So usually a hybrid protocol will achieve the best result. And I think there's also many interesting challenges ahead. So I won't go, go into them in detail, but I'll be happy to, to chat about these offline. Um, and that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's one question in the Q&A about the network speed uh, that you used for the test runs. Okay. Um, are you talking about these uh, matrix multiplication tests? I think so. It doesn't say, but I think so. Okay, okay. So I think for the LAN setting, it's something like one gigabit and WAN setting is maybe 10 megabytes or I could be wrong. So I actually, you can check the paper. Um, it's uh, recently put on ePrint. Um, so the runtime for MNIST is test amortized or just single case. I think it's single case. Oh, yes, I think it was single case. Just one image prediction. Yeah. Th thanks, Miran. I think well, uh, one of the contribution of that is that we actually have to fit the case, uh, single case, into the cipher text in order to make it uh, most efficient. Because it's easy to make a, a batched case with a good throughput, but it's not so easy to make a low latency result because we need to utilize all the slots efficiently. Um, there's another question. 
Will the square layer affect the accuracy? Um, yes, uh, it will, but uh, it, uh, it's not affecting the accuracy by a lot. Um, how does your method for generating matrix triple scale to multiple parties? So it, it works for multiple parties. So uh, we just presented this uh, performance results for two parties. But uh, what we have in the paper works for any number of parties because uh, that, that's what the speeds framework supports. And we, we basically follow the same framework. Oh, uh, this is Vinod. Uh, uh, so do you, know, do you have a sort of a sense of how, uh, you know, this accuracy question, right? When you replace uh, sort of nonlinearities by squares. Mm -hmm. How does that, uh, in general, how does that, you know, for, for, you know, if you forget about MNIST and uh, CIPA 10 and so forth, in general, is there a sense of how, you know, how this affects accuracy? Uh, um, and uh, I guess the second part of this question is, uh, you know, there's recent work of uh, Raluca and, uh, and her group where they, um, they do the training differently. They create the neural network, uh, you know, uh, you know, keeping in mind that it's going to sort of uh, use uh, sort of uh, squares uh, or sort of polynomial approximations, and they don't replace all the ReLUs by polynomial approximations, only most. Uh, so is that, a, is that a possibility in, uh, in what you do as well? Um, yeah, I, I guess so. So I think this is a very interesting open question in the, also for the machine learning community mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, right. to investigate. And actually I have some project um, collaboration uh, with people from our, uh, from our site on um, how, uh, how to select activation functions in order to, um, to, to have a good accuracy, but also be secure computation friendly. So I haven't actually uh, read the, the paper that you mentioned, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a good uh, direction forward. Yes, because for the, for the polynomial approximation, I think one of the things that, that can come up is that um, we can have this overflow of data um, because if we keep doing this squaring, it can uh, it can get uh, arbitrarily large. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the problem that doesn't occur with ReLU. Yeah. Um, so so I think yeah. So we we need some way to actually control the data to be on a on a on the same scale. But if that's solved, I guess uh, probably like they could just uh, start training the model using these activation functions. So there won't be too much accuracy loss when you later evaluate them. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Um, so can ReLU be computed practically with CPKS or BFV or TFHC? Uh, it can be computed, uh, but whether it can be computed practically, I think it's, it's based on uh, each, each person's definition. Uh, there's some recent work which uh, has the homomorphic comparisons based on CKKS, and uh, I think they have some good uh, amortized uh, efficiency with the caveat that uh, if your uh, two numbers being compared to are very close together, then you can get some errors. So, uh, so you can use uh, that to build ReLU, definitely. And uh, the, the question would be then, how would you tolerate the, the precision loss? But, but yes, you can check out that work. Are we able to train a newer network homomorphically? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think there is published work in this domain for now. Beca maybe mainly because it's still relatively expensive uh, because you, you probably um, have to do the um, uh, bootstrapping which makes it uh, even more expensive. Okay. Thank you very much, Hao. And thanks for all the speakers of today and the participants. Um, and we will see you again uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you.